G'day, welcome to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Tech and Bootlosophy is all about boots. I come to you from Wajit country in Perth, Western Australia, and I recognize the traditional custodians of this land. Today, I'm going to take a look at the New York boot maker Parker's brand's Capto Richmond boot. This one in Gaucho Moose from Charles F. Stead Tannery in Leeds, England. So before we start with the boot, let's rewind and take a look at the maker Parkhurst brand. I've reviewed several other Parkhurst boots before, like this one up here, their plain toe Allen boot in dark rose Dublin leather from Horween. Uh, those were factory seconds, and in the review I showed that the so-called QC defect was livable with, and that the factory second price is totally worth the cost. Then there's the iconic green kudu boot up here, which is making a comeback. Such a distinctive boot with Southern African antelope leather. The Southern African antelope is called a kudu, uh, which is also tanned by Charles F. Stead in Leeds, which specializes in suede and exotic leathers that shows the animal's scars and veins tanned in the leather. I've also taken a look at another Parkhurst Capto Richmond boot, this one up here, in the original almond shape number 18 last, and in the raised reverse wax mohawk, uh, rough out leather again from CF Stead. So just very briefly, Parkhurst was started in 2018 by Andrew Savisco, a former stock analyst who saw the need in America for quality boots that didn't cost a fortune. Parkhurst is a small batch manufacturer, which means that Andrew will make small runs with different leathers and makeups of his boots, and often when those items run out, they run out. As a one-man band contracting independent factories to make his boots, Andrew doesn't run to keeping large stocks of hides to maintain stock boots, so the changes to makeups are literally confined to small batches. Andrew is extremely customer focused and attempts to support the American labor and supply chain, but Parkhurst has been particularly hard hit by the supply chain problems caused by COVID, especially over 2021, when Parkhurst practically ran out of material to make boots with. You might want to watch my video comparing Parkhurst to Grant Stone, up here to see my take on the vision and values that drive Andrew. In its short history, Parkhurst has developed a fiercely loyal group of enthusiasts, drawn mainly, I think, by the mission that Andrew set himself. I'm not an American, and so the drive for maintaining a US supply chain isn't the appealing factor for me, but the drive into a clear mission does resonate, as well, I think, because of the very personal and open relationship that Andrew has with his customers. Those of us who have bought Parkers in the past have been empathetic, uh, very empathetically concerned for Parkers in Andrew's supply chain problems. For now, those problems are less acute, and Andrew has started phase two of his development of Parkhurst. Amongst other things, he's developed a relationship with a second American factory, as well as generally diversified supply chains. And that has meant contracting some patterns to a Spanish factory, while still in finishing and maintaining them as well as other patterns in New York State. Phase 2 has also meant the development of different widths, different new styles, upgraded components in heel counters and toe stiffeners, uh, upgraded shanks, and making the cap toe pattern a true cap toe. At the same time, Parkers continues to use their own 602 last, designed by Andrew, and named after the serial number of the US Navy landing ship tank that his grandfather was on in uh, World War II or the Korean War. So as things change, they stay the same. Taking a look at the boot, this is the Richmond model, a cap toe service boot with plain stitching at the toe cap. Parkhurst also has a brogue cap toe model called the Delaware. A service boot is a widely general category, but mainly its design looks back at the type of boots issued to service men and women in the world wars. Uh, modern service boot patterns are less bulky, especially in the toe box, and, I've, and they've been sleeked up to be more dressy. Andrew will switch up leathers and soles, but also switch subtle differences in the design of uh, different makeups of the same model. Andrew will switch between a one-piece and a two-piece backstay, uh, different all eyelets versus eyelets and speed hook combinations, and in this case, a slightly different height. Most Parkhurst service boot patterns are six inches high from the heel to the top of the shaft. 
This one is just under five inches, so it feels more like a World War II US Navy or US Marines boondocker. The color of the moose leather makes it even more reminiscent of the boondocker used in the Pacific War. The color and texture of the moose hide and the rugged commander sole, uh, the lugs also apparent from the side, make this a very rugged looking and feeling boot. It has a medium toe spring, helping it look like rugged workwear. The toe spring of a boot or shoe is the slightly turned up tip of the boot or the distance between the ground and the tip of the boot when you lay the boot flat. This one is definitely noticeable at about three and a bit centimeters or just over an inch. That sounds a lot, but it's not particularly aggressive in the world of boots. A boot is built with a toe spring to make it more comfortable when you're walking. It doesn't need the, the sole to bend as much when you walk. You tend to roll a bit as your, as your foot bends forwards. This means it's easier during break-in and over time, theoretically, a little less creasing at the vent. Interesting historical fact. In olden times, shoes with little or no toe spring indicated you were of the richer classes. We're talking uh, the late 1800s into the early 1900s. Shoes with no or low toe spring tended to be bespoke shoes with very thin, flexible leather soles that indicated folk who didn't need to do much walking. Uh, they were driven from their manor house to the club, don't you know? Uh, walking around the manor was all on carpet, eh? What, what? On the other hand, workers had sturdier boots with thicker soles and needed toe spring to be more comfy as they walked around all day or even when kneeling. The rugged and almost aggressively textured look of this moose leather, combined with the pattern, makes the boot exclusively casual. But I think it's not an exclusively, exclusively rugged casual look. I'm sure you can wear this with light mid-wash or faded jeans with uh, check fleece shirts and rugged jackets like a lumberjack. But you can also wear it with almost western style jeans, shirts and jackets, and you can get away with these boots in a smart casual occasion uh, under chinos and t-shirts, polo shirts, or even button-down shirts and wear them on afternoons at the pub or lunch at a cafe or at a barbecue with friends. They're built tough, so you can take them on a hike, uh, wearing anything from jeans to cargo pants or even modern technical gear. The sandy, earthy, light brown of this leather is certainly versatile and goes with denim, brown, and other earth tones. It will pop with dark colors like black or navy, and I've seen someone on Instagram wear them with red jeans. Not my look, but very interesting contrast. Uh, but they are certainly not dressy. I'm not sure they're dressy enough to wear as business casual, uh, you know, with nice dressy pants, a button down and a blazer. That's probably a little too dressy for these. Now let's take a look at the construction. I usually go from the bottom up, but in this case, this is such a very interesting leather. So let's start from the top and make our way down. Right off the bat, this is called Gaucho Moose from the Charles F. Stead Tannery in Leeds, England. Truman boots have also used this leather before. I think Gaucho is the colour, maybe, I don't know, reminiscent of the soil on the pampas? I don't know, never been there. I can't see why else a South American cowboy Gaucho would be likened to a moose. Anyway, Charles F. Stead is a renowned tannery in England that's been around since the 1800s, the 1890s to be exact. It's always been famous for tanning suede and chamois and in recent years made some very interesting exotic leathers from less commonly used hides like Southern African antelope called kudu and in this case uh, moose leather or more accurately Scandinavian elk. This is a full grain leather as opposed to a suede. When a full thickness hide is received at a tannery, it's split, running it through a horizontal rolling razor that splits the hide. The top half with the side that used to have hair on uh, is taken off to make smooth full grain leathers or they're turned over and made into rough out. Sometimes the grain or used to be hair side is sanded or corrected into top grain leather or sanded even more to reveal some of the nap in the fibers and then made into new buck. The bottom half where the flesh used to be on one side is sanded and buffed and made into suede. This is that top full grain leather. That means the moose or Scandinavian elk hide is split and this is the top half. The top or grain side is not corrected and tanned as it is. This means that all the surface texture of the animal, the hair holes and the pores, the scars and the scratches it had in life, they're all revealed in this leather. Now, 
just in case you're a bit squeamish, as in the case of kudu from Southern Africa, the animals are not killed just for their skin. In the case of kudu, they are pests of farmers because they grow into large herds that do damage uh, across crops in the savanna, uh, and they're culled. Uh, the meat is distributed to villages and the skin sold to tanneries. It's the same with kangaroos in Australia. Not the cute, bouncy, big mice that you might think. Roos are terrible pests and quite overstocked in the wild, so they're often culled. The meat is sold to restaurants as a native delicacy, the oils made into bush medicine, and the skin sold to tanneries. Scandinavian elk is the same. According to the website uh, Wild Sweden, there are more elk in Sweden per square kilometre than in any country in the world. About 100,000 are shot during a highly regulated hunting season so that the herds are kept to a total of 300,000 animals in the country in order to maintain the population. About 100,000 are born in spring and so allowed to recycle the total population. The hunting culling is a conservancy exercise to keep the population healthy. The hunted elk meat is shared apparently uh, within very set rules but also sold in butchers and supermarkets for various Scandinavian dishes. The leather uh, that's used in these boots are beautifully textured and feel quite dry, not unlike the stead kudu used by Parkhurst. Parkhurst tends not to wax or polish the boots, whereas some boot makers, like Grant Stone, will polish up kudu and textured leathers before they uh, box and send them off to customers. It is extremely soft and supple, feels nappy like suede, but it isn't, and when I first got these, they almost felt like the canvas you get in lovingly used basketball high tops. As I said earlier, it's a five inch boot rather than the usual six inches. The collar is reinforced, but it's unfinished. It has eight brown, uh, brown colored eyelets, uh, one more than I'd expect with a shorter boot, but aesthetically surprisingly balanced. The tongue is semi-gusseted up to the fifth eyelet, Pleasing because with the very supple leather, it stops the soft tongue from sliding around. The tongue is a little short. Uh, often when I lace up to the eighth eyelet and tie the knot, the tongue gets caught up in the knotting or annoyingly slips below the knot. Uh, the toe box is very lightly structured. I can feel a stiffener, you can hear it. Probably Parkhurst's usual celastic stiffener, but it's very soft and you can easily depress that toe cap. Uh, the toe cap in these is not a real toe cap. It's not an extra piece of leather sewn on top of the vamp. It's actually a toe cap sewn onto the cut-off vamp. Uh, the vamp piece doesn't come all the way down to the toe. The stitching is double and triple stitched, especially where it counts, uh, for sturdiness uh, and, and long-term use. The stitching is neat. It's not without fault, but with the rugged vibe that Parkhurst boots make, um, they're not glaringly unattractive. Certainly, they don't look like structural mistakes, just a symptom of your handmade nature. A human hand has guided the sewing machine, and as we all know, human hands are not perfect. The heel is stiffer than the toe box. I'm pretty sure that's an external celastic heel counter. I can feel it under this backstay. It's a two-piece backstay, the strip that covers the stitching of the quarter at the back, and the heel cup backstay that covers the heel counter. Inside, the boot is unlined. Honestly, with this soft suede feeling leather, it's perfect unlined. The whole front of the boot is lined with some soft leather for comfort. Looking inside, there's a solid piece of veg tanned insole glued in, and on top of that, uh, under your heel, is another short piece of darker veg tanned leather for comfort and protection. The construction method is Goodyear welting. A thin strip of leather called the welt is run around the edge of the uppers, uh, sewn onto the uppers on the inside, and then the outsole is glued on and reinforced with a stitch that goes through the welt and the outsole. This is a 360 degree Goodyear welt. It runs right around the boot. This is seen as the gold standard of shoe construction because a Goodyear welted sole is resolable, or at least more easily resolable, and it's meant to be more water resistant because there are no stitch holes that go all the way through the boot from the outside to wick water inside directly in. In this case, this is a split reverse veg tanned leather welt. That thin strip of leather is split halfway through from the inside edge. The bottom half that split is sewn onto the uppers as normal, but the upper half that split is flanged outwards and then pushed up against the uppers on the outside, forming an extra moisture barrier. Inside the sole, inside the cavity caused by that encircling welt, 
Andrew uses cork as a midsole filler. Glued to that underneath is a veg stand leather midsole. This leather cork leather in and midsole construction is meant to be another gold standard in boot making. It's meant to be more conforming to the shape of your feet as you wear and compress those natural materials over time. Inside that cork midsole is a fiberglass shank. A shank runs this gap between the heel and the foot pad, giving you arch support and torsional stability as well. Most people think that a shank should be steel and many boot makers will use steel, but I'm very happy with fiberglass. It's light and if you can make bulletproof vests from fiberglass, your shank should be okay. Also, because I travel a lot for my work, it's very airport friendly and I appreciate that. Right underneath the outsole is a rubber commando lugged outsole from English sole manufacturers It's Hide. I feel that this is a slightly softer rubber compound than Vibram's Montagna uh, commando sole, uh, but not so much as you notice a difference when you're walking, only when you use your thumbnails to, to push it in. Um, the heel is made up of a real leather stack on top of the rubber sole uh, layer and then on top of that is a thick It's Hide Commander heel. Apart from being glued, the heel is also nailed in with clinch nails from the outside. That's partly why the leather uh, heel pad insole is, is inside there. The clinch nails are driven in from the outside to the inside and when they're driven through and hit the anvil, the sharp ends clinch to hold the heel on. The heel pad helps to protect your heels from any bumpy and potentially sharp snags. This thing is well put together. Now, how do you take care of this leather? The quick answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> but, but let's just look at this logically. It's not a smooth full grain leather like Chrome XL or Dublin or Essex and so on. So I'd leave out waxy conditioners. So no wax creams, no Venetian shoe cream, no Sophia Renovateur. Parker's recommends Smith's Leather Balm for most of their products. I've never used Smith's, so I won't comment, except to say that it looks like uh, an oil or wax-based balm, uh, maybe beeswax, so I don't think I would use it, especially if I wanted to retain this matte, dry look to the moose hide. So feeling the texture, I'd do the usual cleaning methods, a good brushing. Uh, unless it's heavily soiled, then a wipe with a damp cloth to clean it. If there are marks that I don't like, I'd use a stiff suede brush and an eraser. Uh, for more thorough cleaning, I'd try Timberland's Renew Buck Cleaner. As for conditioning, and I haven't conditioned these yet, I'm tempted to use a suede conditioner. I mean, this leather is dry, and even my hands feel dry just touching it. And although it's not nappy, it feels like new buck to the touch. Even after conditioning, not only do I not want to darken this leather, I also don't want to lose that papery dry feel to it. So when I condition this, I think I'm going to try a roll-on suede and nubuck conditioner from Echo. Uh, you can also, I guess, try a Sophia suede spray conditioner. Uh, just be careful you use the neutral because they come in coloured versions. Uh, Tarago also make a, a similar uh, spray product, only not as expensive. Uh, and then to protect it from marks, I tried Timberland's Balm Proofer Spray. Now, as a disclaimer, I haven't cleaned or conditioned these yet, other than a brushing now and then. So if you use any of the products I've mentioned here, and I'll put uh, links to where you can get them in the description below, please, please test them on an inconspicuous spot first, like here. I don't want to be responsible for destroying the colour or texture of your boots, all right? When I finally do condition these, I'm going to try the Timberland and Echo products, only because I've used them before in my Spruce Kudu and other new bucks, and I've got good results. I'll bring you a video on how that went. Okay now, let's turn to sizing, fit and comfort. I'll talk US sizing since these are American boots, but for UK and Australian viewers, our size numbers are one number down from US, so a US 8 is our 7, okay? Right. My measured US size on a Brannock device is an 8.5 in D or average width. In fact, I'm ever so slightly more than D in the ball of the foot. Usually, when I buy US heritage style boots, I size a half down. I find American lasts run a little large, uh, unlike European lasts and some American dress shoe lasts where I go true to size. So usually, in American quality boots, I would order an 8D. Previously, before Parkers offered different widths, 
the 602 last came in only one width. The 602 last is a combination last where the heel is a different width measurement from the ball of the foot. So it starts as a B width at the heel, I think, and then opens up to a D width at the ball of the foot. So when you order a size 8, you get a combination B to D width in that size. You know, I love this last. It suits my feet. The heel is snug, keeps me locked in place. The waist is also snug, gives me the feeling of arch support. Uh, and the ball of the foot are uh, wide enough not to cause any squeeze at all. Often that's the spot where you feel the most pain. And the toe box is rounded and generous. And so your toes don't feel squeezed and you have room to flex. I think some people with wide feet may have an issue with, uh, with this last. They may have to size up. So if you have any concerns at all, get in touch with Andrew through the email on his website and he'll see you right. For me, I take an 8 in all Parker's boots, whether in this 602 last or in their previous 18 last. They're usually comfortable, but in this case, this felt a little more snug all round than my other Parker's boots. I think this speaks of the handmade nature of these boots. There will be slight variations to how an individual bootmaker will uh, stretch the uppers around the last. Uh, some with more strength, some with less. Also, this is a pretty stretchy leather, so I guess when you pull it over the last, it will give more. And then when you release it, uh, there'll be more of a spring back. At any rate, after several wears, the leather has stretched for me, and so it's still more snug than my other Parker's boots, but they're not tight. Apart from that feeling that it was more snug than usual, comfort out of the box was great. I've never had an uncomfortable break in wearing Parker's boots. The last and nailing the right size for me means that everything just works. This sole though, veg tan midsole and thick lug sole, it did need a few weeks of breaking in to flex it at the point where my feet flex, uh, but it wasn't painful. And thank goodness for toe spring, right? At the full price of 378 US dollars, it's the high end of what I buy. I will sometimes buy more expensive boots from Truman or Whites, but I tend to buy those on sale as seconds or from eBay. So paying full price for these shows my attitude to value from Parkhurst. I think they're worth it. You get a pretty unique boot and boot leather makeup. You get obvious quality in boot design and boot manufacture. I can't see anything wrong with these other than some uh, not precise stitching, but I think that's forgivable for a rugged handmade boot. This build and construction leads to durability, a good fit and comfort. Okay, the arch support is not as good as an Alden or a White's uh, arch ease, but that combination last helps to make your arches feel supported. They're priced in the same range as Grant Stone, some Red Wing models. They're more than Thursday uh, and about a hundred less than Truman and Oak Street bootmakers. I think that's fair. They're made with better materials than entry-level Thursdays and they're not as rugged as Truman, so I think they sit well in between those two. Let me say up front, I'm biased. In a social media thread, some of my friends and I uh, there uh, on the enthusiast group compared notes and we all agreed that the personal connection with Andrew is so good that when we buy another brand, we almost feel as if we need to apologize to Andrew. So are they worth it? Full disclosure done? Yes, I think they're worth it. There you have it, my review of the Parkhurst Richmond boot in Stead's Gaucho Moose. I hope you like my review. I have loads more videos on boot reviews, unboxings, brand comparisons, and other leather goods to come. So if you don't want to miss those, click on the subscribe button below. If you like the video, even if you're already subscribed, don't forget to click on that too. It really helps me out because YouTube recognizes people like the content and will show this to more people who might be interested. It'll help me grow my channel. So thank you, and until the next time, Take care and I'll see you then.